In this chapter, we're going to be looking at chapter 10, motivation, and some of the theories and things that go along with it. Uh, we'll be looking at Maslow's needs hierarchy, uh, Herzberg stuff, uh, McGregor's theory X, theory Y. We'll talk about MBO, management by objectives. What are some of the things that we can do as far as treating employees fairly in the whole idea of equity theory? And then what is it that we can do to actually put this into place? Now you start talking about, in motivation, intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards. Intrinsic rewards are things that is the personal satisfaction that you get. In other words, doing cool work, being able to step back and look at something that you built and see the impact that you had. Extrinsic rewards are coming from outside of you, it's something that is giving to you. For example, raises or promotions or something along those lines. Extrinsic rewards includes perks or perquisites. In other words, things like health insurance and paid time off. You can see some of the things that people really do prefer as far as the extrinsic rewards that might be given. In looking at motivation, it really kind of started back in the late 1800s with Frederick Taylor. Frederick Taylor was known as the father of scientific management. What he did was basically put together a series of time and motion studies to find the most efficient and most effective way in order to get something done. Then you combine that with Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, who really focused in and identified what they were saying was their one best way to find the best way of doing something, the most efficient, the most effective. By the way, Franklin Lil Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, if you've ever read the book Cheaper by the Dozen, that was actually written by one of their daughters. And all of the things that were in there were basically about Franklin, Li Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. Now Frederick Taylor, his, um, his concepts have really been put into place by UPS. UPS drivers have strict rules and requirements as far as what it is that they do when they're delivering packages. His four key principles were study how something is performed. In other words, look at what are all of the tasks, how long does it take, what are some things that you can eliminate to get rid of the unnecessary movements? Codify that, in other words, put in the rules, find the right people to do those things, and then establish a fair level of performance and pay. By the way, a couple of, uh, of stories that go along with uh, Frederick Taylor. He was actually uh, from outside of Philadelphia and he was working as kind of a, a shift manager for a manufacturing organization outside of Philadelphia. One day when his ship, when that first ship, they were working first sh two shifts, okay, you had a day shift and a night shift. At the end of the first shift, he walked over with a piece of chalk and wrote down the number of things that they had done that day, the number of, the, the amount of output that they had and walked away. Second shift was coming in and saw the number great written on the, on the floor and said, what is that? And the first shift folks were saying, well, that's how much we produce today. When first shift and Taylor came in the next morning, their number was crossed out and a new number, a bigger number was put in. He just walked away smiling. At the end of the first shift, that number was crossed out and a bigger number put into play. And so one of the things he started to see was, okay, there's some things there as far as motivation that was really coming into play there. He also identified uh, the one best way as far as shoveling things. So for example, he was working for a, um, a power company and for that power company, people would come in to work and they would be shoveling different things. They might be shoveling coal, they might be shoveling dirt, they had all kinds of things that they were shoveling. And they all brought their own shovels. One of the things he found was different things that people shoveled weighed different amounts. There was different mass that went with it. And what he did was he figured out what was the optimal shovel load that people could do on a significant 
basis. In other words, do the most possible without getting too tired. And what he did was he, he identified the shovel size for that amount of, of weight and that topic or that thing that was being shoveled. And so what he did was he set up a, a tool room with different size shovels. And when people came in that day, they were assigned to shovel different things and they were given the shovel that they needed to shovel that different thing. Productivity went up, went through the roof. The efficiency went up, things like that, because people weren't getting tired and they really did find the one best way as far as what's the right shovel load. Then you had Elton Mayo. Elton Mayo was actually a, uh, a researcher out of Harvard. He was hired to go into uh, the Hawthorne Works, which is outside of Chicago, and where they made a bunch of... Um, a bunch of relays, they did a bunch of electric, electrical work for phone companies. They put together all of the equipment for phone companies. And in his research, he found that there were, he, what they found was what he called the Hawthorne effect. They did it in three phases. The first phase was a lighting room. They had, an, had this theory that if you increase the lighting, output would go up. Because if you think about a manufacturing area at that time, they were dark, dingy, things like that. And so what they did was they set up a room. They had a bunch of people in there who were doing the work. And they set the light and everything. And then they increased the lighting. And productivity went up. They increased the lighting again. Productivity went up. And so it was really kind of interesting. The more they increased the lighting, the more productivity went up. And they said, okay, let's verify this. So they started decreasing the lighting. Productivity went up. Decreased the lighting again and productivity still went up and they said, okay, it's not lighting. So then they had their second phase, which was called the relay assembly room. What they did was they got a, a group of women and put them in a room all by themselves and they were assembling various electrical relays and they didn't have a supervisor or anything like that and they said, okay, let's try some different things. And what they found was productivity and efficiency went up because the women had input into what it was that they were doing. They could talk during the time. They would cover for each other if somebody was not feeling well, things like this. And what they found was they made a change to the human relations. And then there was the third phase, which was called the bank wiring room, where they really didn't do much as far as in, input like that. But what they did do was provide more cash incentives. And they found that cash incentives actually worked against the motivation. So it was really kind of interesting is that whole idea of the Hawthorne effect is basically saying people will act differently when they know they're being studied and human relations and how you treat people is going to have an impact as far as their motivation and their output. Now Maslow's needs hierarchy, a guy by the name of Abraham Maslow came up with his hierarchy of needs. Basically he was saying that there are five key things that motivate folks. A lower level need, if it's unmet, will be motivating. In other words, people will be motivated to satisfy that lower level need before higher level needs are motivating. Physi physiological is basically air, water, food, things like that. Once those needs are satisfied, then people are motivated to satisfy safety needs. In other words, having a roof over their heads and things like this. Once safety needs are satisfied, people are motivated to satisfy social needs. They want to be around people. And then esteem and then self-actualization. And what Maslow was saying was it was a lockstep approach. And once this lower level need was met, then this would be motivating. Before he died, he actually recanted and he said, it doesn't work, all right? Because they found that People could be motivated at different things at different times. You could be motivated, motivated by a couple of things. For example, a company decides that they're going to do a layoff. People will be motivated in a couple of different ways. First of all, safety. In other words, how am I going to feed my family if I lose my job? And also, esteem at the same time. Why me? So it's not just a lockstep, and people could be motivated in a couple of different places at the same time. Then you had a guy by the name of Frederick Herzberg. Okay, Herzberg came up with his two-factor theory. 
He said basically there's two key things to think about when it comes to motivation. You have motivators and you have hygiene. Motivators are things that get people jazzed, that get people excited about what it is that they're doing. Hygienes are things where if they are present, they are preventing dissatisfaction. But if you take them away, then you have dissatisfaction. So motivators are things like <clears throat> doing cool work, getting recognition for what it is that you're doing, having the opportunity for growth and advancement. Hygienes are things that prevent dissatisfaction. In other words, policy, working conditions, pay. Just because you add these things does not mean people are going to be jazzed about doing their job. But if you take them away, they're really going to be upset. When you think about how Herzberg's two-factor theory and Maslow's needs hierarchy relate, his hygienes, Herzberg's hygienes, relate to these lower levels of motivation for Maslow. The motivators relate to the higher levels. So that's how you can kind of think about how they actually relate. Then you had Douglas McGregor who came up with his Theory X, Theory Y. Okay? Theory X is basically saying people don't like to work. All right, You have to make them work. Uh, they'd rather be directed. Their primary motivation is fear and punishment. Theory Y is basically saying people love to work. It's as natural as play. They will seek responsibility and things like this. This actually moved into leadership approaches, looking at that Theory X and Theory Y, how you actually try to treat and motivate folks. Then you get into the idea of goal setting theory or <clears throat> management by objectives. Management by objectives is basically saying that it is a cycle where you are setting objectives at one level, which then feed down to the lower levels. And because you have these objectives, which might be a stretch, but attainable, you will be motivated to achieve those objectives. So for example, senior managers will set their organizational objectives, which then flow down to lower levels. And you link employees' goals to those overall objectives. You monitor what's going on, evaluate, and then reward the performance. So a lot of organizations have done management by objectives. In other words, here's what it is you need to accomplish. You set a stretch goal. You're motivated to achieve that stretch goal. I've done the same thing uh, as far as things like my cycling. I will set an objective of being able to ride the MS-150 by September. And I, what I want to do is I want to ride the century or 100 miles in the first day. And then the second day, either the short route, 35 miles, or the long route, about, uh, about 75 miles. Because I have that goal throughout the year, I am riding my bike, increasing my mileage as I go, so that I can achieve that objective of riding a century, 100 miles, in one day. It's very motivating. Then you have what's called expectancy theory. A guy by the name of Victor Vroom came up with this idea of expectancy theory. Basically, it's saying people are motivated by a couple of things. First of all, they ask themselves, can I do it? If they can do it, then they're saying, okay, am I going to be rewarded? And if they're going to be rewarded, is it a reward that I value? Is it worth it? If those things are there, you're going to have motivation. If either of them are not there, then somebody is not going to be motivated. If you think about it, that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Personally, I think Vroom hit a home run with this. That whole idea of where you can step back and you can say, all right, does the person believe they can do it? If they can't believe they can do it, they're not going to be motivated, okay? So maybe they can believe that they can do it, but they don't feel that the outcome is worth it. So what are you doing to make sure that it might be worth it for folks so that you get the motivation? Nadler and Lawler came up and kind of modified that, saying, okay, what you have to do is you have to figure out what it is that people want, okay, as far as their rewards. Some people want certain things. Different people want different things, okay? 
Figure out what it is that they need to achieve, okay? Make sure that it's attainable. Make sure you tie the rewards to the performance, all right? So that really makes a lot of sense. You have to remember, if people don't feel that they can do it or they're not going to get a reward that they value, they're not going to be motivated. Then you get into the idea of equity theory. We compare ourselves to what others are doing. Are we getting the same thing that they are? In other words, if I feel that I'm putting in a certain amount of stuff and it's more than somebody else, but they're getting paid the same amount for, as me, I might back off as far as my effort because I see a perceived inequity. Or if I think that somebody is getting more than I am, I'm going to back off because, hey, why should I even do that? And a lot of times it's based on perceived inequities because a lot of times we don't really know what somebody else is actually putting in or what they're being paid. Putting some of these theories into action, first of all, think about job enrichment. The whole idea behind job enrichment is to provide some things so that people can be motivated, more intrinsically motivated, to do things. When you think about the characteristics of work, there's skill variety. In other words, am I using multiple skills? Task identity. In other words, can I see the outputs of what it is that's actually going on? Do I see the entire picture or just a piece? Task significance. How does it make a difference? Autonomy. Can I make my own decisions? And what kind of feedback do I get? So, for example, when you start talking about job enrichment, Example might be, let's say you're making chairs, all right? Your job is to make just the left front chair leg. That's all you're doing is the left front chair leg, and you do that all day long. Well, one of the things that they might do is what's called job enlargement. In other words, okay, you're not going to do just the left front chair leg. You're going to do all four legs. Basically, what you're doing with job enlargement is saying, okay, we're going to take more of kind of the same and give you that to you to do. Task identity is basically saying, okay, I'm doing the front left leg of the chair. That's all I see. But task identity is saying, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have you build your skills, in other words, skill variety, and you're going to make not just the legs, but also the seat in the back. In other words, you can see the entire thing that you're manufacturing. That makes a difference. So that's the whole idea of job enlargement and job enrichment. Job rotation is basically having people work in different jobs and learning some of those new skills. Another key is, is communication. All right, Are we, as managers, communicating openly and honestly with people? We need to make sure that we're creating a culture that does listen. That we really listen to what it is that, pe that people, that employees are saying. We're using effective questioning techniques and we're actually doing more coaching versus challenging. We need to make sure that we're clear as far as what our communications are and we want to make sure that it's easy for employees to communicate with us. We also want to think about how we are recognizing uh, a job well done. It could be through advancement opportunities. All right, sometimes that's not possible, depending upon the skills of the person. Giving them some challenging work, maybe some paid time off or some of these things. A lot of these things tend to be kind of extrinsic and they are things many times that people do appreciate to, for the recognition. One of the things that I've done is I have put another document out there in the module on Canvas that talks about informal recognition. It has a bunch of ideas that you can use and some of them are really very different as far as things that you can do to recognize someone. So you might want to check that out. Then you also start thinking about motivation across the generations because we have several generations that are still in the workforce. For example, baby boomers, who tend to be more of the senior managers in the organizations now, Gen X, who are coming along, and then Gen Y are the millennials. Then you also have Gen Z, okay? 
they're all going to be different in how they are motivated, and things that motivate them, and how they communicate. So when you start talking about Gen X, okay, they want some of the economic security, but they focus more on career security than jobs. In other words, they really do focus more on their career and their discipline. They will jump ship, as far as organizations are concerned, in order to practice their discipline. With millennials, with Gen Y, Gen y they have a tendency to jump ship so that they can do something totally different. They tend to be very impatient. They're tech savvy, all right? In other words, you see them walking around with their phones all the time, texting and things. They think that they can multitask and are efficient, not necessarily true. And they place a high value on work-life balance. There are a lot of issues in organizations now where the millennials are saying, I don't want to work overtime because they have, want to have more of that work-life balance. If, as a millennial, to be happy at work, okay, try to make more of a positive impact. See what it is that you can do to have some sort of an impact and think about how you are positively impacting somebody else. Try to set up a, a good relationship with your supervisor. Don't expect your supervisor to come to you all the time and do things for you. You need to do things for your supervisor. Never stop learning. Always keep that open and work hard. If you want to play hard, you need to work hard also. Then you have Gen Z, which is really the youngest um, generation in the workplace. Tend to be a little bit more cautious, all right? Wanna, wanna improve the world. They wanna make a big impact on the world and things like this. One of the problems that we have with the millennials and with Gen Z is they have a tendency to think they're ready to be president of the company before they really are. You, sometimes you need to put in the time you need to pay your dues before you're ready for some of those senior types of positions. When you start thinking about the communication across all the generations, there's going to be differences. Baby boomers, baby boomers want primarily face-to-face -face and by phone, all right? Don't do texting as much or email or anything like that. And don't even think about doing like, you know, social media and stuff. You want to communicate well with boomers, what you need to do is talk to them face to face or at least by phone. Gen X, they're much more comfortable with some of the online stuff, same with millennials. Millennials very much get into the social media aspect, but they don't want to communicate by phone. I can't tell you how many times uh, with my kids, I'll get a text from them and I'll say, ooh, I need to talk to them about that. And I'll immediately give them a call and I get voicemail. And so I send them a text, call me now, sort of thing. So one of the things to think about is, depending on who you're dealing with, there's going to be some differences as far as the preferred methods for communication. These are some of the key points from the chapter. If you have questions, please give me a shout.